Welcome to another episode of the Impossible Life Podcast. I'm your co-host, Nick Surface, and I'm looking across at a man who is the only human on Earth to bear his name simply because he killed all the others. That's right, friends. The former <laughs> Navy SEAL. <laughs> Garrett Unklebach, a man who has eradicated imposter syndrome by being the only Garrett Unklebach left. That's true. <laughs> yeah. Now, this stems from a uh, something that Garrett says all the time when he gives out his uh, Instagram handle, which if you're not following Garrett, you should be. It's at Garrett Unklebach. What do you say every time? Um, well, it's it's Instagram or Cash App or Venmo or whatever, any any handle. They're all Garrett Unklebach because what I say to people is I'm the only one. There's no others. Yeah. They're I like killed Highlander. all of them. He killed all of them. And then, of course, I got... Because I, I have a unique last name. Literally, anyone who has... There's a different German spelling for my last name. So anyone who has the same last name as me, you're related to me. Well, yeah. And there's not very many of us. Right. Um, so there is only one Garrett Unkelbach. So it's really easy. like people look at me when I say my name, I'm like, just type it in. I'm the only one. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's where that came from, because I, I unfortunately, even though my name is not common either, it's not. a. There's, is, a, there's other Nick surfaces. There, well, there is one. Yeah, I, I discovered this. There was one kid on Facebook that I discovered years ago. I was super disappointed because I thought I was the only one on Earth. What I actually lost out to is somebody has at Nick Surface. So I'm at Nick Surface one, which Garrett coached me to say, you need to just go kill all the others. And I was like, mm, you know, but when I when you when I first got your email, I'm like, Nick Surface one. Yeah, you're like, what is this? And I'm like, dude, I, you know you know what it actually is? It's some car. First copy. It's some car detailing place that like gets the Nicks out of the surfaces uh, of your, your car paint. I lost out to. That's a slick name for uh for a guy named Nick who does car repair. I mean, maybe I missed my call in life. It's like Noah used to <laughs> Noah used to clean cars and he had a car business called I know a guy. <laughs> Did he really? Yeah, it's perfect. That's actually great. people say like, oh, yeah. oh, you you like I clean my car, you need a guy. Oh yeah, I know a guy. Here you go. <laughs> that's I actually like that. That's, no, that's clever. Well done, counsel. All right. Well, in the yeah, It's hard to sell that business. <laughs> yeah, it really is. Well, maybe not. You sell some with a sense of humor. But the second, uh, this is the second week in our limiting belief series, and yes. we are covering a big doozy because we, uh, I've said many times on this podcast and off this podcast that identity precedes purpose. So if we covered limiting beliefs on identity last week, G, it is only logical progression that we would then cover purpose because I think where people bump into identity and they don't know, I think people wrestle with purpose and they do know, and it drives them nuts. Like, this is what we get asked about more than anything. But if you remember from last time, a limiting belief is a thought that mm -hmm. terminates potential. Correct. If you care about where your life is going, that should catch your attention, that something could terminate your potential. Yeah. And so identity, there's a lot of thoughts that terminate people's potential, but the way that you think about purpose, and that's what the impossible life is, hey, we want to help you think better. Mm -hmm. We want to help you think about the right things. The way that you think about your purpose can be terminating your potential. Yeah, exactly. Um, so when most people think of purpose, G, and uh, you know, I, I, this is very, uh, finger in the air, but this was, I think when I think of pop references to purpose, chariots of fire, right? An old movie. Oh, and yeah. I've heard it quoted in church, out of church. I've quoted it. Yeah. And I, we've quoted it. It's a wonderful movie. And the main character in there is an athlete and they're, they're trying to say, Hey, you need to, is it seminary school? They're trying to get him to go back to. And he's like an athlete on the track team. I think so. Yeah. And he says, you know, when I run fast, I can feel his pleasure. And there's like, there's such a... God made me to run. Yeah. And when I run, I feel his pleasure. Right. And th there's such a like releasing element to that. And I think that there's definitely an element of truth of, of something being used for its intended use, like God giving you a gift and then you using it to its fullest is definitely a thing of God. The only problem I have about that question, that, that thought process is what happens when he can't run anymore? <laughs> right? Like that, that's what we're going to get what, into. And... and and God has that for all of us. There is a designed purpose yes. for each of us. Ephesians says that God created us for good workmanship. I talk about uh, every Saturday at Mighty Men when we talk about Romans 12, 1 and 2, I talk about holiness and what mm -hmm. holiness is. And holiness is to be used rightly or yeah. to be used correctly. Like when a hammer hits a nail, a hammer was designed to hit nails. And when a hammer hits a nail, that's holiness, right? Right, And so all of us have an intended design. We have an intended purpose and we want to walk in it. I don't want to be, uh, I think I've talked about this in the podcast. I have a concept. I'll get to it eventually, a concept for a kid's book about a hammer that falls off of a carpenter's oh, yeah. truck yeah. right? and he goes to all these places and it's not the right place for him. Right. Right. And, until another carpenter finds him and puts him into the work that he's supposed to be and then he's happy again. You know what? I'm realizing why God put myself and Lindsay in your in your life because the concept of you writing a kid's book to me, um, I just have a lot of jokes going through my head that I could see, you know, 
it being very straightforward. I'll, I'll go on a book tour and go to a bunch yeah. of like kids' <laughs> library. They're like, why is this author smile? He's intimidating all the children. No, no autographs. <laughs> Yeah. Goodbye. Actually, we need a 10-foot barrier for your own safety. You know, people have been known <laughs> to spontaneously combust from the intensity of this child's book. Anyways, all right. So, gee, we're, one of the, so what you can expect, what we're going to do, we're going to look at l- common limiting beliefs that people have around purpose. We're going to talk about where people go off track, how to get an understanding of where you're at, and most importantly, how to start living your purpose mm-hmm. today. And that may sound like an over-delivery, but I promise we, will, we are going to knock all that out. There's a great line oh. that I love from... The Matrix, but not ma- not the first one from Matrix Reloaded. Ah. And Morpheus says there's a difference between knowing the path mm. and walking the path. And for what we're talking about today with purpose, you've got to learn how to walk the path of purpose. And that's what we're going to get into. Most people think that they just want, like, if God would just tell me what yeah. my purpose is, that they could know it. What's so more important than you knowing your purpose is that you learn how to walk the path yeah. of purpose. Very good. So if, if purpose is a path, I think where a lot of people think of it as a destination. Oh, 100%. And, and, and that's so cliche to be like, life's a journey, not a destination. I got Aerosmith in my head right now. <laughs> like I can hear Steven Tyler singing that. It's a great line. Yeah, it really is. Great song. That was actually my first concert. Nice. Just little bonus nugget there. Um, if you don't count Carmen and all the Christian stuff I went to as a kid. I mean, like, Yeah, because if, if you count those, my first concert was Skillet. Nice. Okay, there you go. Yeah, but, those, but the ones I chose. I but, don't know why they wouldn't count, so... Oh, whatever, man. We'll cover this on another episode of The Impossible <laughs> Life. But but that thought process of, of it being a path, it, it changes the dynamic. And that's really important to note because, uh, you know, like we're going to get into that more. But but to go back to what we were saying about like limiting beliefs and like Garrett touched on earlier about them terminating potential. I think when we when we covered it last week on purpose or on, on identity, there was a lot of obvious limiting beliefs that are telling you like, hey, you can't do this. And those are those are obviously negative. The Some ones, people don't realize that they have limiting beliefs. Right, exactly. If you have good friends, and uh, there, there's a big definition for that of good friends, not just people who care about you and love you, but people who can be direct with you, people yeah, who see what you're sure. capable of, people who want the best for your life. That's really what good friends are. If you have some good friends or good brothers in your life, they'll help. They'll be like, dude, you are uh, that you you are lying to yourself. You mm-hmm. are limiting yourself when you start when stuff is coming out of your mouth when you're acting in a way that you're cutting off your own potential. Yes. Sometimes you'll have people in your life. These are people who love you and they can see more in you than you see in yourself. Yes. Very and it's good. great to have those people. And if anyone's ever told that to you or you think that you might be struggling with limit, like man, I feel like I'm supposed to be more. I feel like I'm capable of more, but I don't know what's holding me back. This series is a great series yeah. to listen through and catch what some of those limiting beliefs are that you may not be aware of. Yeah, most people are not aware of their own limitations. Right, and what, like you said, a real friend is going to be like, "Dude, listen to what you just said." Yeah, I once heard somebody describe it like if if you heard somebody else talking about someone you love the way you talk about yourself, you'd probably want to go punch them in the face. There's a lot of uh, that's for sure. There's a lot of little things that I correct myself on or correct others on. That you know what that this isn't what the series is about, but you know what leads to limiting beliefs? It's words, mm. right? Just those little words that you allow into your vocabulary, yeah, right? For good. me, one of the things that I won't say, and I was ta- I talked with uh, one of the guys in Giant Killers about this today. Um, one of the words that I won't say is I'm exhausted. Yeah, I don't say that either. I learned that from PK. Right, because when you're yeah. saying that you're exhausted. You're saying like I got nothing left in exactly. the tank. I'm not capable of anything else. Or one of the other definitions for exhausted is used up. Right. Is that how you would describe yourself? No. No. Even if I've given uh, as much as I feel like I can, I can always go one more. Yep. Shout out to our our man Nick Bear. Yeah. Yeah. You, you can always go one more. You can always keep pushing yourself. But I say that to say, I corrected a guy on that today. I was like, hey, you know what? You need to take that out of your vocabulary. Yeah. And so those little things, like words become thoughts, mm-hmm. become those limiting beliefs in our life that just completely hold us back. Yeah. And perfect segue, G. Some of them are obvious, but like most people wouldn't think of exhausted because it's like, oh, I don't mean it that way. Some of the most dangerous limiting beliefs, because like it says, it terminates potential, are the ones that are good but not best. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that's what a lot of the, the beliefs around purpose are, and these are the ones we're going to get into uh, today because so much of purpose, it, it's it's having a belief uh, that will get you to a certain point to stop. Like what we, with the example we gave earlier, if it's a destination, well, once you get there, that then you're there. There, you know, wherever you go, there you are. Okay, well, hey, we're here, we're good. Purpose is a path. Exactly. And what does that mean? It means you just keep walking. So let let's get into that. So, gee, I suppose the first obvious thing is like, where does purpose come from? And I feel like this may be super obvious, but I still want to share it with everybody because I think it's important to understand. Yeah, purpose comes from God. 
uh, like we said earlier, and it's in Ephesians, God created you for good workmanship. Mm -hmm. So when he made you, what that means is for, for every single person listening to this podcast, when God made you and, and Bible says that God knew you before you were born, yeah, right? Before you were even conceived, God knew you. And when he made you, he made work for you. And so the way that I see that is think about your life. Uh, I love what how, how Pastor Keith talks about fingerprints and fingerprints can unlock doors, right? Uh, the way that I think about my life, think about a key and a lock, mm. right? And your your purpose is like a lock and who you, like it's, it's something that you're going to do. It's a way that you're going to live. That path is going to culminate into you advancing the kingdom. Mm. And how that's going to be done is the, like the purpose, there's a lock on those things and you are the key. Right, And so you've got to develop yourself. You've got to become who God made you to be. You've got to grow into that. There's a lot of maturity. There's a lot of struggle that you're going to go through to sharpen that key and make the key, right? Make yourself into the key that God created you to be to unlock that lock of purpose, Yeah, right? Because where the impossible life or the thought of this, where it came from is about James uh, one that talks about the crown of life. Yes. Those who patiently endure testing and temptation will receive the crown of life. And that's what, that's what we want. The crown of life mm -hmm. is to those who have endured, right? Till the faithful, till the end. Yeah. I want to get to the end of my life and hear well done, good and faithful servant, right? That's, that is my purpose. That's what God has planned for me. And there's things that God made me to do work that God made for me to do on this earth. And I want to live up to those things. I don't want to get to heaven. And God's like, well, I'm glad you're here, but you didn't do what I intended for you to do, right? Just like for your children, you want to see your children live up to their potential. You're capable of a lot, son. You don't want to see yeah. them waste it. I don't want to waste what God's given me. Yeah. Right. And so uh, I say that to say, God gave us a purpose within all of us. He also put this thing. This is what's so interesting about scripture. You can learn a lot from what scripture says. You can also infer some things from what scripture doesn't say. Hmm. And nowhere in scripture does it say this is Garrett Uncle Bach's purpose. Right. What it does say is that I have one, that it's unique and God made it just for me. Mm -hmm. And so if God gave me a purpose, but he didn't show me, he doesn't tell me what it is, it means that I, I'm supposed to discover it. I'm yeah. supposed to learn what it is. And God also put this thing within us. That's why I love the scripture, Ecclesiastes yeah. 311. God placed eternity in the human heart. And so God put this thing in us that will draw us towards him. Mm -hmm. And also, right, like I, I talk about this at Mighty Men all the time. I've been all over the world, met a lot of people, and I've never met men who didn't wonder what their purpose is. Yeah. Because God put that yes. inside of us. Men are men. Animals do not stare at the sky yeah. and and say, "Why am I here?" Right. right. I have a dog that has the most human eyes. Like when you look at him, you think he's going to say something to you. I mean, he's just a dog. Yeah. Right. He's never looked up. He just wants food. It's, it's all that's his eyes say, "Give me steak," though. Yeah. yeah. Like that's that's really what he's saying. He's never looked up at the stars and right. said, "Why am I here? Yeah. Why did God make me?" But man wonders this. Yeah. And I love that so much because the thought process of why has an inference that there's an intelligent design. And where does intelligent design come from? It comes from a creator. And what eats away at men more than anything is that question, it, why? You could, this is picking it apart, but you could take just that statement, why am I here? Why am I here? Right? So you can, what, what, why implies that there, there's a purpose. Exactly. Why am I here? Yes. Why, that, the I implies, like the, focusing on the I, is there's a specific thing yes. for you to do. And here is about the sovereignty of God. God has put you mm. where you are for a reason, for things that you're supposed to do. Yeah. I was saying to G beforehand that like ever since I was young, I, I can't remember a time when I didn't like this. Um, I, I just used to love to look up at the stars and I, I just would sit there and kind of ponder like, man, I know there's something greater for me than what, I mean, it wasn't like I was dissatisfied with being in elementary school, <laughs> you know, or anything like that. But I just had this feel and it got more as I went on. I would just look up and be like, man, it's such, it's so big and I'm so small, but it's I know there's something greater. Oh, it's, it's very sobering. Pale blue dot is actually uh, right on it's our on, wall. Yeah, it's on the wall. Indeed. And and that that's such a good I've perspective. That, well, that poster came from my wall when I was in high school. Really? Yeah. And mine was up when I was in, in <laughs> diapers, so I went. Anyways, but there's a scripture that we love. It's Psalm 8, 3 through 4. And it says, when I look at your, at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of yes. man that you care for him? And it's that is such a, I just, I can relate to that so much, man, of just, of David going like, look at this big, beautiful place. But it's not just that he, he, that God cares for us. He gave us dominion over those things. He has a plan and a purpose for us. He loves us. He's made us sons in his image. I, it's I, so much greater. I imagine that when uh, David was a young boy, he spent, and as a shepherd, he spent a lot of time yeah, at night. For sure. Just staring up at the stars. 
and where that perp- where the, the purpose question comes from. Because I mm-hmm. went through this, and I went through some of this in my own life. When I was the first time I asked this question, right after I graduated high school, or as I was graduating high school, I was just I felt like there was more for me in life. I felt like I wanted greatness, and I just did not see anything in front of me that was exciting. Yeah. The idea of going to college good. sounded like a nightmare to me. Right. And I, I asked God, like, God, why did you make me this way? Yeah. Because it wasn't like accusatory. It was just like, I don't understand. Yeah. I feel like I'm capable of so much and I feel like I'm just, you know, doing nonsense stuff. Mm-hmm. Right. What is it that you want me to do? There was a sense of dissatisfaction. Yes. Right. I felt like I, it, it wasn't just, I felt like I was capable of more, but I wanted to do more and mm-hmm. I didn't see the more to do. Yeah. Now, now really capture that because I think a lot of people might be in that. The, it's a process, and you and oftentimes it it starts with dissatisfaction. You may be okay. Gary. You can find it in different ways. That's yeah. how I found it. Yeah, but you can find that level of dissatisfaction of why in different ways. Yeah, the, what drove me to depression, oddly enough, as I talked about all those looks up at the stars, was the fact that I felt no sense in what I did. It was like the 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 deep sense of eternal pull I had on my that I had in my spirit that I was not living up to was ultimately what drove me to a deep, dark depression because I, the thing I hated most, if you ask me to summar, summarize depression, what I hated most was waking up and feeling like every day was the same and there was no movement and no purpose. Yeah. That's actually what ate at me. So it, there's, there's, you talked about the question of why am I here? And that's a, that's a, a somewhat mature it's, thought well, process. There's, there's an attitude when you yeah. say, why am I here? Um, there's somewhat of, there's an implied purpose in that and also an implied duty. Right. Yeah. Right. Because if you think that if you've already determined that you, the purpose of your life is to have fun or to enjoy yourself or do whatever you want, you wouldn't be asking the question, For sure. why am I here? Yeah. Some people uh, that this is, I mean, this is depression that goes down a dark road. If you haven't figured out like that there is a purpose for my life and the purpose isn't about me. And then you think your purpose is just having fun and enjoying yourself. You'll find no meaning in that. Yeah. And if you've already wrongly determined that there is no greater purpose for me, then that's when people just kill themselves. Right. It doesn't matter that I'm here. Right. And yeah. so there is a there's an implied level of service and duty when you're asking this question either of God or just asking it in general of like why am I here but like what am I supposed to do right. There's, yeah. a, there's an implied level of service and duty to that because the immature thought of your life is what when am I going to get what I want out of right. life? Yeah, right. That's people's longing in life is is to fill the void on the inside. Yeah, and it and it is the same void. It's the Ecclesiastes three eleven God placed eternity in the human heart. Yeah, but it's people trying to stuff the wrong things in that void. Yeah, that's so good, G. Because I think a lot of people for their purpose they'll feel like, man, well, when I get that dream job or when I get to this, then it's going to be like, that's going to make everything better. I'm going to feel I, when this When I purpose. have money right. and you know, the thing that I don't have that seems hard for me to get, when I have money, yeah. then, then I'll feel different. Yeah, then and I'll for have the, the purpose. And for the people that, that go and get it or whatever yeah. the thing, whether it's money or people liking you or fame or whatever your idea of success is, people go get it. And if they had asked that question wrongly, they'll, they'll, get, they'll get that thing and then realize, man, that... I don't feel any different. Exactly. And so, you know, a lot of people, and I, I experienced this myself, you just keep trying to get more of that thing because you think you must not have enough, and it is exhausting. You're literally, I, I had a, a cognitive behavioral therapist describe it to me like you have, your goal is your hand, and you've got your arm straight out in front of you. And so every time you step towards your hand, it, it you think you're going to get closer, and unfortunately, when you step forward because it's your arm, the hand moves forward <laughs> as well. And so you get on this never-ending cycle, and that's a lot of people. And so it is, it's that purpose question of like, you know, when do I get what I want? But you don't realize you're asking that. It feels like you're pursuing passions or dreams or the, whatever it the, may be. The guy who's, you know, in, I think of the, I love the movie, uh, The Pursuit of Happiness with yeah. Will Smith. The Very guy good. who is riding a bike, I mean, the guy who's walking everywhere because he has, you know, nothing. Yeah. Just wishes he had a bike. The, yeah. bi- the guy who has a bike wishes he just had a car. The guy who has the beater car wishes that he had the fancy car. Right. The guy who has the fancy car wishes he was a millionaire. And it just goes on and on. Yeah. Right. You can you can spend your entire life chasing after the things that you want. Right. And so really the thing that you've got to cure for yourself in life is you do need to go after the things that you want, but you also need to get focused on the right things. Yeah. So so that's good, G. So let's get into some of the must knows and the, the requirements for purpose. Because like I said, I want to equip people so they can live today with purpose. So the must know. And this is uh, maybe not what you want to hear. It's one step at a time. 
Yeah. It's not, it's, you know, we said it's a path. Well, imagine there's a lot of twists and turns and you can't see past the first turn. That that's that's what it is. It's not seeing the end from the beginning. Well, it would be like, and we'll we'll go to some scripture here in a second. But you know, your son is in the elementary levels of baseball. Yeah. Here, this is what a bat is. Right. This is what a ball is. The bat hits the ball. You run around the bases. Right. Um, it would be like if you did that, and then people are expecting to go from okay. I I mean, I know what baseball is now, and they're going to hit a major league pitch next. Right. There's, you know, to go from, if, right. if, if, even if you're the, you know, Shohei Otani, how old was Otani when he made it to the MLB? Uh, I don't know. He's been in here for a little while now. I think it's, I think he's, I don't know, probably like early twenties. Yeah. Greatest player in a generation right. is now in, is in the MLBs, MLB in his early twenties. And there's guys who make it the MLB right at 18 and 19. Juan Soto is a great example. Maybe right. At but, 19. but even yeah. still, yeah. You're, you have the greatest potential. You are an all-star of a generation. You didn't get there until you were 19. Right. Most people aren't even going to get anywhere close their potential by 19. But still, it is a process of, hey, you've got to learn mm-hmm. what this thing really is. Romans 12, 2 talks about this. Paul says, do not conform to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will understand God's will for your life, which is perfect and pleasing. And so he's talking about transformation. This is this process of us growing into death to self, right? Well, that, that sounds so fun. Mm, this process of up. other th- things in our life dying and new things in our life growing. It doesn't happen all at once, right? Right. When Very you good. first come to, to Christ, he's going to slowly change you over and over and over. And it's a long, it's a lifelong process, honestly, of sanctification where God's continuing to let ha- have things in you die and new things grow. And the scripture says, don't be conformed to this world, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will understand God. The, the word then indicates the process. Then you will understand God's plan for your life, which is perfect and pleasing. If the transformation part is never, never stops, that means the revealing of purpose part is never going to stop. Mm. If the transformation yeah, just happened good. all in an instant, then maybe you could get God to give you your purpose right. all in an instant. But the way that it works is as God continues to change you, he reveals a little bit more of your purpose. Yeah, very right. Good. You're not going to see the finish line of your life from the starting line. You're just going to see checkpoints. Mm-hmm. Right. Even if, if you go run a race, right, you run like a 50 miler or a 100 miler and not and one that's not just a lap. If you run a point to point race, you're not going to be able to see, see the finish line from the starting line. You're going to run from point one to point two. Point two is at like mile five, right? right? There's going to be checkpoints along the way. God will begin to show you checkpoints in your life. Your dreams will mature. What's in your hand will grow and change. Your, the things that are in your heart will develop, and you'll see the next step. But God's not going to take you like, okay, now that you said you're committed to me, here's the whole plan. God yeah. leaves the middle as the room for us to learn to trust in him, as the place for us to develop who we are. It's where transformation happens is in the middle. Yeah, that's so good, G. So so that's what you need to know. But the requirements, and it's kind of built into what you said. Well, the first requirement is you have to have faith because you, why else would you act on action? Why else would you have action about belief if you didn't actually, that's what faith is. It's putting action to what you believe. And so when you're, when you're understanding that purpose is one step at a time, you're going to move with what you have at the time. We talk about this at, at Mighty Men all the time. I, I, I use this example about transformation. Uh, Pastor Keith once did a series. This was a long time ago when I was a teenager, but he did a series on transformation and he talked about the caterpillar Mm -hmm. and the butterfly. Yeah. Right. Because the Greek word for transformation is metamorpho, the same as the scientific word metamorphosis, right? Where a creature becomes something else. And the example we have in science of that, if you were, if you remember this from science class as a kid, you learned about metamorphosis. It's where a caterpillar turns into a butterfly and a caterpillar puts itself in a cocoon literally creates a coffin for itself Mm. where inside the caterpillar dies, liquefies and turns into a butterfly, right? If you look at a caterpillar and a butterfly side by side, they don't look anything alike. Mm. It doesn't, a a butterfly is not a caterpillar with wings, but I say that to say in this process of the caterpillar cocooning itself, I've watched a lot of men. If you watch a caterpillar cocoon itself, it starts down there. They don't have a shape like a human, but imagine if you, you know, pretended to be a caterpillar be like you started tying up your feet first yeah. and then you slowly cover yourself all the way up to its head 
up to its chin, and then it continues to spit out this liquid and it covers its entire body. Mm. And a lot of men get stuck in their transformation at the part where their chin's sticking out. Right. Right. They've come all the way up to the point where you've got to go completely under the water. And there is a faith part of our transformation process. Thing is, with following God, you're going to go through a lot of transformations. Yes. You're going to go through the transformation of just having faith to believe in who God is. Then you're going to, then God's going to work on you, transformation and continuing to die to yourself believing for the next thing that God's taking in, taking you into. And you'll go through this process where you literally cocoon yourself up multiple times in mm-hmm. your life where God transform you. And it takes a lot of faith to do that last part. Yeah. Right. You can come all the way up to the chin, just hoping that you're going to like feel differently about the process. Right. But when you get to that point where literally you're putting the nails in your own coffin, it requires a lot of faith and who God is to be able to move forward. And so transformation requires faith. Yeah, and, and, and once again, in here in what you just said, it also requires surrender because what, what has to happen for, for that last part, right? You have to literally be laying down your own dreams, your own desires, like your own right to yourself, your way of thinking. There's the, exactly what you said. Thank God it's a process, right? Because if you just had to dive in face first and just give it all up, I mean, you know, it's a hard thing. But well, the, the reason it's a process is because God will not rob a man of a good opportunity to grow. Mm. God allows men to go through trials. Yeah. You, may, you may be innocent. God will let you go through the trial. Right. Because that's what's going to mature you. In this pro, so moving from faith into surrender, surrender is where you've got to take the things that this is like to surrender. This is why Paul introduces himself this way in scripture as a slave. Paul, Paul introduces himself in scripture as a slave to Christ because that's what he's submitted to. Mm-hmm. You're going to be submitted to something. Right. You may, you may be submitted to yourself. You may be submitted to the world. You've got to, you're submitted to something, whether you like it or not. You, you may say like, oh, I'm, I'm so free. I can show you all the chains that are attached to you. Yeah. Right. We're all submitted to something and to, to surrender to God, to go through this transformation process, you've got to take the things that you care about the most, the mm-hmm. things that you want the most, and you've got to come to God and say, God, I want what you want. Yeah. Right. This is um, one of my favorite scriptures. Psalms 78, 72 says that God used David for the skillfulness of his hand and the integrity of his heart means that what was in his heart was true towards God, Mm. right? There was not a lack of alignment between what God, like the heart that God made for David and who, what David desired for himself because the heart is the desire center. Yeah. Very good. And so where we have a lack of integrity in our heart is we have competing desires, yeah. right? Our heart is not true. Our heart has, this is what who God says I am, but I want all these things for myself. And to get to that place, you've got to take the things that you thought you wanted the most and literally put them on the altar. This is Abraham with Isaac, mm-hmm. right? God said, I, hey, I want you to have this, right? And then Abraham starts feeling like Isaac is his. And God didn't want to kill Isaac. But God was testing Abraham's heart. I want you to realize that I gave you Isaac, right? right? And don't start loving Isaac more than you love me. Yeah. And, but when you'll surrender these things, again, why, why are we talking about all of this? You want to get over these limiting beliefs so you can move yes. forward. Yeah. And if you're ready to move forward, here's the scary part, but this is the true part. You've got to let go and you've got to give it up to God. And so to surrender, you got to get on your knees and say, God, if you don't want this, I don't want it. But when you'll surrender to him, that'll allow you to move forward. Uh, for some people that might be out there thinking this, and this just popped in my head, so this is for somebody out there, you can interpret God asking Abraham to sacrifice Isaac as like a really like, man, I don't know about this God, right? You can read your own lens into it as if a human sure. being asked you to do that and be like, well, he can't be that good because why would he ask me to do that? What, what you have to understand is God is God of order, mm-hmm. right? And when you are out of order, you will not have God's best in your life. That as much as we do not understand that, that was God's definition of good. And that was an act of kindness for him to say, look, lay this down, because as long as it's laid down, then God can flow through it. And what did he do? He made Abraham into a great nation. And and, and that may we may miss that point because we know the whole story. But oftentimes, whenever God will ask us to do something, if we don't see the good in the moment and we can't see it ourselves, that's where it gets hard to surrender. But that's where you have to know God and trust his nature. Thank God that Abraham didn't ask I God didn't ask Abraham to sacrifice Isaac, you know, the day he was born or on day one. Hey, here's the promise. You're gonna get pregnant the next day, nine months later, sacrifice. He had walked with God for twenty five plus years at mm-hmm. that point. I think he was twelve, so it would have been thirty seven years. And like I think that that's a picture of his goodness, but that's that's something that you have to understand. When you the best your life could ever be, the most flow, the most enabled, the most sense of purpose is when it's in God's order. It's really important to note that. 
Uh, the last thing, and we talked about it before, but I just want to state it. We said that you, you must know it's one step at a time. It requires faith. It requires surrender. And what does that mean? It requires uncertainty. It means that you got to be comfortable with being uncertain. And I think that that breaks so many people because I've said this before. If you were to say to people, hey, if you work for five years really hard, 60 hours a week, you're going to get whatever, whatever your dream is. You're going to get this and it's going to come true. Most people would be like, well, would probably still fail. But there's a lot of people that would be like, you know what, I'll do it. And they would stick with it. Well, the best example of that uncertainty, and I, I love this, it's coming back to Abraham and Isaac, the surrender is, God, you asked for this, so this is what I'm going to do. Right. And then Hebrews 11, it's not It's not in Genesis, it's in Hebrews 11, it says that Abraham reckoned that God would bring Isaac back from the dead. Right. Yes, I love that. Right. And so Abraham didn't even, like, he just reckoned. That's not right. what happened, if you don't know their story. Right before Abraham's about to kill Isaac, God presents a, the angel. An angel of the Lord comes, stops him, and there's a ram there stuck in a yeah. bush. So instead of sacrificing Isaac, Abraham sacrifices this ram. God prevented the uh, provided the alternate sacrifice. Yeah. But Abraham, as he was going up, right? Well, this is what God told me to do, right? As Abraham was going up, it says that what he reckoned was that God would bring Isaac back from the dead. Mm. And so there's there's faith in that. There's surrender in that, but also. Abraham didn't actually know what God was going to do. Right. And what a lot of people want with God is like, God, I'll, I'll honor you when I know that you're going to do what I want you to do. Yeah. I'll honor you when I know that it'll work out. And people, a lot of people are saying like, man, I just don't have enough faith. You don't need that much faith. Yeah. Right. You've just got to trust. You've got to act on the faith that you have. Abraham didn't know. It says that he reckoned mm -hmm. that God would bring Isaac back from the dead. And it's not even what he did. And Abraham didn't even know that he would do it. It's really just him. I, I guess this is what God's going to yeah. do because God had said that, you know, through me, I'd become the father of many nations and he finally blessed me with this son. So it's supposed to be, Isaac, this is what you said. I don't know how it's going to work out. There's going to be uncertainty in it. Yeah. And this is Abraham saying, well, you know what, whether he brings Isaac back or not, whether I have to kill Isaac or not, this is God's plan and God's plan is good. And that's the uncertainty, which you can be certain about is God's plan is good and yeah. that he has a plan for you. Everything else is uncertain. Yeah, and if you want to wreck your uncertainty, just ask yourself, what's something really good in your life? And then ask this question, did it happen the way you thought it would? There you go, right? I met all the so best true. things in my life did not come the way that I thought they would. Literally everything. There's not one thing that I'm like, that went exactly as I thought it would. All right, so before we, we're going to get to the limiting beliefs and how to live purposely now. But before we do, here's a cautionary tale. Uh, I was a young go-getter at the age of 20 years old, and I had an important decision. <laughs> oh, man. I, I, I think I would enjoy meeting 20-year-olds. Dude, people. I, you know what? I'm so glad we don't get to go back in time because if Garrett of now could go meet 20-year-old <laughs> me and I had to be there to watch it, it would be painful. Uh, anyways, that's a thought process for another time. Um, but yeah, so I'm 20 years old, man. I've got a big decision. It was about a relationship, and I was seeking, I was, you know, I was following Jesus at this time. I was like all in. And I thought, you know what, man, this is really important. Like this is, you know, this is a relationship with a girl and somebody that I thought I might end up marrying, whatever. And so I was like, I really need to, to, there was some history there and liked her, thought it was a good thing. Spent seven days fasting and praying. I'm talking like water only, bro. I, I was already Dang, ripped at this time because I didn't have anything to do except for work out. So I was like, I was already ripped. I got down to 168 pounds as a six foot two guy. So I, I lost about... I think I lost That's, like uh, fighting weight. Yeah, it was. Yeah, I was ready. I was ready. I, I got I got super lean and um, I still made the wrong decision, man. <laughs> <laughs> After seven days. And I mean, dude, I sought God like I, all I would, fasting. No prayer. Dude, no, I did lots of prayer. I did kidding. lots of prayer. I read my Bible. I like went all in on, on missing this. You know what I missed, man? And here's the cautionary tale. <laughs> what was in my heart? And, and we talked about this. We talked about surrender. I wasn't fully surrendered and I didn't even know it. And so the cautionary tale is like if there's something that you know that you're passionate about and that you're you're feeling strongly conflicted, please have a mentor. Because the one thing I didn't do in that time was to seek out some wise counsel that was around me. I think about people who have, you know, they're in the job that they hate and they have this dream and they want to just quit on a day and just walk off and pursue it. That may I'm not saying don't do that. I'm not saying do that because but this is where you need to have somebody in your life that can help you see clearly. You need a mentor that has your best interest in mind. Go back and listen to our mentors podcast yes. that can help guide you and keep you on the path. Because I can tell you that a lot of times you can get conflicted because you're so passionate and with what's going on inside you. And and it's just a blind spot. And you need to go find mentors. Rarely are mentors going to find you. Right. That's 100 percent right. Okay, G. So let's get into some of the these are the limiting beliefs. And like I said to you, 
these are definitely not something. Yeah, because remember, like you may still not even be there with us yet. Like how is purpose a limiting belief, right? right? Now we're going to get into here's some of the specifics of how your misconception on purpose is terminating your potential. And ultimately, like we touched on an identity, like a lot of your beliefs will be this. It's also always about the source, right? Yeah. About where you're getting them from. So a lot of people, and this is the common thought process, is that purpose is something they do. Right. And it's what we talked about, which is the, the des- it's a destination. So where this fails and it's very easy to see you, this is this requires a lot of uh, knowledge and wisdom. And you have to have a be able to see the end from the beginning in order to know that. Because, for example, in your life, Garrett, if being a Navy SEAL was your purpose, bro, your purpose stopped seven <laughs> years ago, man. Like, how are you surviving? Yeah, it stopped. Yeah. Eight years ago now. It's uh, been eight years. Wow. I, I watched a lot of my friends and I watched even, you know, people who were leaders in my life make that transition. Right. And they had determined that their greatest days were behind them. Yeah. Right. Their purpose was over. Right. That was the purpose of my life. And a lot like the the group that I work with and have a lot of respect for and have done events with the Honor Foundation, they help a lot of guys make that transition in a great way. I was in a class with guys who really thought they're like, well, that season of my life was about me now I'm just going to like, you know, figure out how to pay the bills for a little bit until my kids get out of school. Right. Right. Like it was a very undetermined and unmeaningful destiny. They thought, well, I guess that was the only meaning that there was, that the the only meaning in their life was what they do or what they had done before. This is, you know, professional athletes struggle with this. Dude, parents will struggle with this. You see people that this empty nest syndrome is a thing for a reason. There's, I mean, you can struggle with this in whatever you do. It's not just if you've reached a really high pinnacle point. People that do very common things, people that retire from their job, what happens whenever uh, you see a lot of people, they die. I, I've, you know, I heard this story about this person who waited to retire and they died. Actually, it was one of my friends I used to work with. His dad died 10 days after he retired from work. Oh my gosh. Like, and, and how much is that? You know what I mean? But that's the thought process. Well, and if you had thought the purpose of your life was to make it to retirement, oh man, that was a lot of work that, for not very yeah, much time. That one did not work out. So, but, so, but thinking that purpose is what you do, I want to just shatter this limiting belief, right? This, this piece of the limiting belief, here's what the Bible does say about your purpose. Your purpose is to advance the kingdom of God, right? If you're a professional baseball player, do you only advance the kingdom of God by putting a bat on a ball? No, there's a lot of ways that you do that, Mm -hmm. right? If you're a Navy SEAL, do you only advance the kingdom of God by doing SEAL things, jumping out of planes and blowing stuff up and diving and shooting? Is that the only way that you do it? No. Right there, you have so many ways to advance the kingdom of God. So, if you're thinking like what I do, what if uh, David had thought just being a shepherd was how he advanced the kingdom of God? Moses certainly thought that when he was 40 years old and God met him at the burning bush. Moses is like, dude, I'm just like a, a desert nomad. Right, I'm, I'm nobody. Right, his purpose far superseded what his the skills of his hand. Right, right? and so your purpose is not just about what you do. Don't get stuck there. Or this is a thought that will terminate your potential. You'll never make it to your real purpose if you think, oh, it's just what I do. It's just what my career or my title is. Right. And so here's where surrender comes into living purposely, also with an understanding that there's seasons in purpose. And that's why we said it's not just something you do, because the problem with that is that if you determine that what you're doing now or what you're going to do in future is your purpose, it can make you think that either what you're doing now is worthless or what you're going to do in the future is worthless. And that's, that is not, like we said, it's a path. It's a lifelong thing to advance the kingdom of God. So f- with the surrender comes an understanding that God has directed your path. It says a man's heart plans his way, but the Lord, is, Lord establishes his steps. There, there's three seasons that we, we put in, for, that we identified, and we'll get into the challenge of this. It, it's preparation, it's active duty, and then it's sowing. Now here's the, pro- here's the real place where people stumble. You don't always know what season you're in, and you definitely don't know how long that season is. You can look at people in the Bible. Joseph had an extremely long active duty portion. David had an extremely long active duty portion. But guess what? They also had a lot of preparation, and it would have been easy to get in the preparation just like you said. Well, being a shepherd is is what God made me for. Killing that giant, that was my purpose, and now I'm going to go on the Killing the Giant tour, and that's going to be all I'm going to talk about for the rest of my life. The majority of our time in the SEAL teams was preparation time. Right. Majority of the time is preparation time. And it's not like, oh, well, I'm ready for active duty, so let me just sit around until they call me up. We would train for a year. We would take a week off or 10 days off, go spend time with your family, and then we would deploy. 
And I, but I think a lot of people are just waiting around, like wait until they call my number and then I'll go get my stuff together. Right. We spent our time, all of our time training this. If you want, if you don't know what season of life you're in, you're in preparation. 100%. Season. That's yeah. the season that you're in. It's where right. the frustration lies most often. And, and that preparation is not a comfortable season, right? Most people are trying to get out of the preparation season as soon as you can, because it's not the reward season. Right. And if you're reward or outcome focused, then all you're going to be thinking of is like, man, I got to, I didn't actually get in the game, right? When you're a kid, we've all been there. Like I love, I enjoyed playing golf. I enjoyed playing baseball, all the stuff that I did as a kid. I didn't like practicing golf. Right. I didn't like practicing baseball. I like playing the game. Right. Right. And so that's inherent to the way that we are as people, but you've got to learn to love the preparation season because when, the more you, you age and mature, the more you realize the way that time works. Yeah. When you're a little kid, you just like haven't figured out this concept right. that the time will come. Yeah. Right. You always want it to be now. As you mature, you're, you you quit trying to like just wait for when's the moment going to get here. You learn how to be where you're at, mm. and if you can learn to be in preparation, like be in preparation season when you're when you're preparing, be in preparation season, not be in preparation season and just wishing, man, I wish it would start yeah. sooner. What can I do to get to the next level? I love this thought um, from the book Chop Wood, Carry Water, and I may get the 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 years wrong here, but there's if you've ever read Chop Wood, Carry Water, there's a great moment in that book. I think we've mentioned it once on the we podcast have, yeah. before. There's a great moment in that book where this kid's trying to become, you know, like a samurai archer and he's finally starting to figure out the process and he goes to the uh, his his master and he's like, Master, you know, you've told me if I do all of this stuff, you know, if I train every day, I shoot this many ar- arrows, all of that, that it'll take me eight years to become a samurai archer. Well, what if I shoot twice as many arrows every day? How long will it take me to become a samurai archer? And he says, 16 years. And he's like, wait, what? Because the process yeah. is, it works a certain way. And so if you think just doubling down on a certain effort or when can I get past this milestone to try and get out of preparation season, learn to love preparation season and you'll get out of it the fastest yeah. because there's lessons that you have to learn. Sure. And if you're trying to skip the work, you're 100% skipping the lessons. Yeah. Can you imagine? It'd be like taking a five-year-old and being like, you know what? Let's just forego all this and just get them a driver license, driver's license now. No one thinks that's a good idea, right? Because you can see there, that's going to be a disaster. And what's going to happen? The, the Everyone's going to get hurt. The reason you can't get your license till you're 16 isn't because you can't touch the pedals. Yeah. It's not a height test. Right. To get your driver's license. Exactly right. Right. I, I was driving when I was 12, unlicensed. Right. Right. But my father had spent time with me and there was a level of maturity. I wasn't just driving down the roads all the time. I drove down a bunch of ranch roads. I did drive down the road a couple of times yeah. for some specific like purposes. Story. Yeah. Um, but the that that works the same way right like life uh, or their society has determined you should drive at 16 because you've been matured yes. long enough not cuz you're capable right, right? If, if they let kids drive at 13 because they were you know 5 6 and could touch the pedals then that would cause way more accidents. Yeah, if it was just a height test, there'd be these kids that like hit puberty earlier that are like well, let's just get you a smaller car. Yeah, we can get you like a, a motorcycle yeah. that you know, you can drive at nine. We got the pedal extenders. You're going to be fine. It's a terrible, and like, that's a great analogy. Imagine that process. Oh, with like, imagine Hope on no. like a little mini bike on the road. She'd be okay. She's smart. It's more the younger guy I worry about. <laughs> like, if he got a hold of something, imagine Grace with that. Oh my gosh. Yeah, people would get hurt. And that's the whole P- point. Other people would other get people hurt. Other people would get, but that's the whole point. And that, that's what Grace happens. Grace would drive a monster truck. But that's what happens whenever people try and forego the process yeah. is, is, is people do get hurt. And just to say, because we didn't spend time talking about but the sewing part, you might wonder why that's at the end. If you look at every single person's life, you get to a point where you've you've kind of run your race as far as the active duty part. And so what are you sewing? You're sewing what you've learned, all the lessons, what you have into the into a field that's not your own. Mm-hmm. This is going to be into others, whether it's your kids, whether it's people that have been drawn to you, whatever it is, people that look to you. That's every single I mean you can look in the Bible, you can look at any story. That's what that's how it finishes in purpose is that you sew. If you do not learn to love the preparation season, Here's what I can guarantee you. You won't love the deployment. Yeah, very true. If you don't prepare accordingly, the moment will get there and you will instantly be filled with regret that you did not prepare well enough. Yeah, very good, G. All right, so the, the last two limiting beliefs, I think that, that it's what I do is the most common one. But uh, this is another one is it makes me happy, right? And, and this is people who... You know, if you if you do what you love, you'll never work a day in your life. Everybody <laughs> loves that quote. Well, that's not what the Bible says. Uh, Genesis 2, um, God put Adam in the garden, and he said, work it and keep it. This yep. is before sin, so God made you to work. Exactly. And so if your idea of uh, your purpose 
is me being happy. I mean, I, you know, it's so easy to have lifestyle envy of like, mm-hmm. oh man, I just wish I lived in this state and did these things. That would be such a great life. Right? If you live the life that you go, whatever like vacation right. is to you, you'd be there for a few months yep. and then you would be filled with uh, a immense amount of emptiness just like why what am i supposed to do here i love going to the mountains right but if all i did was just like i'm just going to be mountain climber guy my life would not feel the way that it does i love getting to go there i love spending time there my life is not made to just like be a mountain man yeah your temperature body temperature was but not your life (laughs) i I i would not be upset if you know like there was some sort of drastic climate change wow. and then Texas this got a, hot take. a lot cooler <laughs> yeah. and Texas was not, you know, a hundred degrees in the summer, but you know, God has put me here or 94 in October. Like it is right now. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Uh, so yeah. So it, a lot of times when people f- say that about passion and it'll make you happy, you're pursuing a dream, not purpose. And like we said, it, it's a dangerous maturity question. You, you probably have a strong pull of purpose, but remember the immature question for purpose was when do I get what I want? Mm-hmm. And, and, and you're not consciously asking yourself, but that's what it feels like. It's like, Oh, it'll make me happy. And I'm not saying that your purpose won't give you a flavor of fulfillment all its own, because in my own experience it does. And you can have joy in it, but that's not the be all and end all. Go talk to some, if you feel that way, right? Like my purpose is, you know, I, I just want to get on to, like, I want to do what, what makes me happy. Go talk to somebody who has deep meaning in their life, mm-hmm. feels like they're exactly where God's supposed to, they're exactly where God wanted them to be and go ask them what their story and what their journey was like. You can listen to mine on here. There's a lot of other people's that you can listen to. Find someone that you think is living the life that you want and ask them yeah. if they feel like, man, every day is just like, I'm not saying that I don't in, enjoy getting to do what I do, but I'm not doing what I do because I think it's what's going to make me happy. 100%. I have so much joy in my life because I feel like I'm walking down the path of purpose that God's given me. Yeah. And that's where I say it's a flavor of fulfillment, not necessarily happiness because happiness can change in a hot second. I feel like fulfillment is, and, is more prominent. And if you've ever, to me, happiness is like sugar. If you, if you like binge sugar, yeah. if you, I mean, sorry, if you completely cut off sugar and you don't have any sugar for like months, you'll have like one tiny little piece of sugar and you're like, oh my gosh, yeah. that was so good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But then you, then you start eating more and more and you'll get to like, if you are just like no limitations on yourself, eating as much sugar as you want, it starts to make you feel bad. And even like when you, you'll eat like a massive amount of it, it doesn't make you feel the way that it used to. And that's what happiness feels like. Happiness is just like candy. You know what? You can have some every once in a while. But if you think the purpose of your life is about eating candy, you're a five-year-old. Yeah. It's Dr. Michael Grandner on our podcast. He's yeah. talking about people who smoke weed for sleep. It's like, yes, it helps you. Then the problem is you just keep needing more of it until you get to a point that it's it's like an unsustainable amount. And isn't that such a picture of temporal things, man? Mm-hmm. I thought that was so interesting. All right. The very last one, and we've touched on this, we've we've, uh, uh, but it's worth stating, is that you need to know before you go. If you're waiting for some grand vision where you just get this like moment of inspiration and it all becomes clear to you, uh, I'm going to tell you that y- you might have uh, you might be going down the wrong direction, right? If that's if that's what you're waiting for, and you get something like that. I remember that. when I was in high school and being around other kids from church. But where are you going to college at? I'm just waiting for God to tell me yeah. where I'm supposed to go to college. Maybe that meant they were waiting to see where they got accepted to. Um, <laughs> right. It's like a, a church way of saying yeah, it's that. a holy way. Yeah, but. If you're just, man, I'm just waiting for God to send me an email. Right. I'm just waiting for a guy to show up at my door and deliver a black box with my name on it. It doesn't work that way. Very few people did God appear to in the Bible and directly speak to them. Yeah. Here's your purpose. Here's I'm going to use you. I'm not going to say it doesn't happen, but if you're waiting on it, you're going to be waiting for a long time. Yeah. It's one step at a time. So here's how to start because that's what we really want to get to is how to start. And I think you guys can all see Garrett has this saying that I know drives people mad. If you want to li- if you want to know your purpose, start living purposefully. And that's like giving the word in the definition of the word, you know? And um but but it's what that means is is like we said before, there's seasons. If you feel frustrated, if you feel like you're working a job, if you feel like you're in a place where you're like this is not my life and you're frustrated, you have to understand that's preparation mode. You're in preparation season, so you need to be as, as excellent in what you're doing now. Why? Because you, you're surrendered to God and you trust that if you're not there, it's just a not yet. 
And so you have to be excellent at what you're doing. Use it to glorify him and trust, hey, God, you know what? I'm not enjoying this. This, this doesn't feel like where I should be, but I'm going to trust that you're going to open a door. And I have never, ever, ever done something excellently and been like, well, that was a waste. Because at the very least, I learned. And at the very best, somebody was watching that I didn't know, and that's what led to a next. If I can say that phrase in a different way that makes is a little less catchy, but a little more understanding, like, like Nick said, if you want to know your purpose, live purposefully. Right. The other way to say that is if you instead of saying if you want to know your purpose, say if you want to know what God's plan for your life, live as if the things that he's given you, the place that you're in, wherever what you're doing right now, it matters in its preparation for where God's taking you. Right. And as soon as you start doing that, as soon as the purpose switch turns on in your life, you realize, okay, I'm here where I'm supposed to be to learn, to grow and move forward. And so instead of getting finish line syndrome and like saying, man, when am I going to see where I'm supposed to go and get this perfect picture and get a plan where I'm at is where God has me. Now, where do I grow from here? So I need to take on this attitude of personal growth and development. I need to have this, uh, this process in my life where I'm going to continue to seek God. I want God to change the desires in my heart. I want a heart that wants to serve God. What things need to get removed out of my life? How do I need to go through this transformation process? And God will show me the next step. And when that door opens, when God shows me the next step, I need to have the faith, the trust, the obedience to immediately move. And I'll go to the next level of transformation. So if you want to, if you're tired, of sitting around and waiting. God, God's not waiting on, I mean, we're not waiting on God. God is waiting on us. God is waiting on you to mature. God's waiting on you to grow. God's not looking at you saying like, man, I just love keeping this guy where he's at. What a ding dong, right. right? That's not how God feels about you. God wants you to grow up and mature the same way that I'm, I'll be, you know, I love, I'm not, I, I'm not saying like, I don't love the times with my daughter, but I, I look forward for her to the time, like I'm not, I don't, I'm not trying to rush her to be in 10 years old, but I look forward for her to the times that she doesn't think life is about eating popsicles, right? She will grow on to another season of her life where she finds the great calling that God has for her. And that's what I believe for everyone who's listening to this podcast, that you're going to grow on, that you're yeah, going to mature, cool. that you will move into this place where you realize God has a great plan for your life. And what I've got to do is I've got to enroll in the process. I've got to start living as if today matters and let the training that God's putting me through, let the preparation that's happening in my life just be the next step to the purpose that God has for my life. 